Hi, this is Paul, and I'm back with Nathan Jacobs. I had a conversation with him initially, and we went through quite a bit of his life story. He's a filmmaker. He's a philosopher. He's a theologian. He's, he teaches, he teaches uh, college. He does all kinds of things, and he himself has a very interesting story. And so I've, I've been, he's been gracious enough to allow me to continue to pick his brain on a number of these topics. So... Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan, for being willing to talk. My pleasure. Thanks for having me back, Paul. Well, I, I first, you first came across my radar screen with those videos from Ancient Faith. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was particularly interested in some of the, some of the, what you've, realized with respect to the relationship between nuns and duns, the personhood of God, and mm -hmm. their ideas about karma, about justice. And so I'd, I'd like to go into that a little bit more. Sure. Could, you, could you summarize, I don't know, you know, it's a little unfair because this is right off the cuff. Could you summarize <laughs> maybe some of what you began to notice Sure. Listening to people and maybe even exploring in yourself because sure. I was, I've been watching the same thing happen. And so when I heard right. you talk about it, it's like, wow, I'm not <laughs> alone in seeing this. That's right. Yeah. So I would say that, that the, the, the way I always uh, point this out when I'm doing a talk, like the one um, you came across, which was a Midwest clergy convocation, right? It was all these Orthodox priests who wanted to hear from me about uh, nuns and nuns, even though most of my research is on the nuns, and I had to tell them that candidly. I think I think duns are a different sort of story and need to be dealt with slightly differently uh, in terms of how you do your research, and I gave thoughts on how to do that. But nonetheless, with the nuns, one of the things that always stood out to me was what seemed on just a, an initial glance like a contradiction. So you would, uh, you would see when you ask them, so what were the sorts of things that were questions that were really troubling to you, that you know, pushed you away from Christianity? And you'd get answers pretty commonly like problem of evil, problem of pain. Um, and they would, they would talk about, you know, like Emily in Becoming Truly Human, my film, uh, says, you know, tells this horrible story about her uncle falling asleep and, you know, burning up because he had a cigarette in his mouth and all this. And she talks to her mom and her mom says, well, God has his reasons. Things happen for a reason. We just need to trust him. And she's like, well, why? Why do we have to do that? Um, and she just was dissatisfied with this, you know, blanket trust of God and the idea that somehow this horrific thing could have meaning. But then when you fast forward and we start talking about positive beliefs and where are you now, uh, that very same Emily will say, well, I definitely believe in karma and fate. Things happen for a reason. And when you put these next to each other, it looks like just an overt con contradiction. I couldn't embrace Christianity because my mom said things happen for a reason. Uh, where am I now? I definitely things, think things happen for a reason. So you think, well, what is that, right? So the uncharitable readers say, just say, oh, she's not thinking clearly, uh, contradictions in your worldview, this happens all the time. But I think, uh, I think the important nuance there, uh, which is the one that you're referring to, is that um, when you talk about God, and God has a reason for this happening, you're talking about an anthropomorphic person. Right? You're talking about someone who was watching, who could have stepped in and stopped it and didn't, and in this sense is in some way complicit with the evil itself. Uh, and that's a pill that's too difficult to swallow. Whereas if you say karma or fate, you've created something wildly impersonal. It's more like the laws of physics. So you get what you want in terms of a belief that um, the world is just, right? This seems to be part of, part of the karma fake narrative, um, where things are just, what goes around comes around. If you do bad things, eventually that'll catch up with you. Do good things, you'll eventually be rewarded. And it's all sort of self-correcting and works its way out. But there's no person orchestrating that. It's just sort of a, 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 an impassion, a dispassionate, um, non-capricious, which I think is also critical to that, um, impersonal force. That's, that's moving things along in this way. And I think that's the key difference. I think that's how you avoid an overt contradiction there, uh, is that this one is, I can't accept that things happen for a reason if 
that reason is guided and orchestrated by somebody who could have, you know, you know, made things work out differently and could have stepped in and didn't and supposedly is good, but is complicit in the evil and so on. Um, whereas this one, if it's just sort of like, it's just a blind force and it's self-correcting and things like that, that's an easier pill for me to swallow. And I think that's how they balance it. And I think that's a really important nuance in their thinking because at the end of the day, it's not an embrace of chaos and nihilism, right? With, with this sort of shift, you still have a belief that the world is meaningful, things do happen for a reason, there's justice, there's good, there's evil, there's rewards, there's punishments, all this, sorts, all this sort of stuff. Um, all of that is retained in the worldview, but you get rid of the anthropomorphic component of it that makes it too difficult to embrace that that's personally orchestrated. And I think also one of the other things that you get rid of is um, I think there is a worry that God, the Christian God, the Judeo-Christian God might be capricious. Maybe he's not really trustworthy. Maybe he's not really good. Um, and when you make it just an abstract force, you also get rid of that worry that it's arbitrarily uh, functioning. You can say, well, uh, it's only function is to reward and to punish and uh, and it's more like physics and it's it's not a it's not a biased individual it doesn't have political parties it doesn't you know <laughs> all that sort right. of stuff right. uh, and so I think that's that's a big part of of what's going on there so yeah well and and then you went on in your talk to talk about this movie which after I watched your talk then mm -hmm. I watched your movie then I watched <laughs> life itself because I right. that when I find something interesting I want to do my homework. Yeah. And, and so this movie Life Itself, which, which I found to be a fascinating movie, especially mm -hmm. after having listened to your lecture and you pointing this out, and it, mm -hmm. was, it was just sort of manifest there. Now, probably most of the – Life Itself wasn't a blockbuster. I had never no. seen it or heard <laughs> about it before. Uh, right. Do you want to give a little summary, maybe without too sure. many spoilers – Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the light, I think the best way, and you, you pointed this out when you talked about it um, in your podcast, which I watched, this is how you and I first connected and you introduced yourself to me, let me know. And I, I took a look at that. And, uh, and as you rightly pointed out in there, uh, life itself is pulled from the thesis statement of the film, right? So you have this one character who is, uh, I think she's doing her uh, her doctorate, maybe, or master's thesis, one of those two, uh, in English literature, I think it is. Uh, and she comes up with her thesis statement, uh, and she's focusing on the unreliable narrator. And she basically goes into this long, um, you know, sort of monologue about how the unreliable narrator is a gimmick, um, and it's not a very good gimmick, and there's a few, you know, few instances in works which it works. But, you know, you know, you really need to go with the reliable narrator, but, and this is where she points out, every narrator is perspectival and has their own biases, and therefore every narrator is inherently unreliable. So the only truly reliable narrator would be life itself, where you, you know, you are somehow able to step back um, and see things in some sort of objective way but as she points out, life itself is always misdirecting us and causing us to think that certain people are good guys when they're in fact bad guys and vice versa and all this sort of stuff. So she suggests that life itself is the truest, you know, most, you know, the, 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 the truest unreliable narrator, right? And, and this sets up the entire point of the film, which is you really don't know in the film, there are certain people who seem to be good guys who are maybe not as good as they seem, and certain people who seem to be bad guys who are maybe not as bad as they seem. Certain events that are horrific, but the way they play out seem to have this uh, end result that you just can't get yourself to want to abandon because they're so beautiful and, and, you know, essential to the story and so on. And so really when she's setting up the thesis statement about life itself being an unreliable narrator, she's really offering an entire picture of what the film itself is doing, which is this web of characters who um, are not always what they seem and the way they intersect and the way they converge and the way the, their stories, which appear disconnected, end up converging in a connected way, end up having this beautiful result, even though you start very early on with some horrifically ugly uh, 
uh, things happening to these characters. So I'd say that's that's a that's a big part of it, and and I think that's I think that was one of the best pictures I've ever seen in cinema of the sort of worldview that I see at work underneath uh, the majority of the nuns that I've spoken with. It was it was very interesting. I did a conversation. So on my channel, I have a lot of conversations with people like yourself, often people who come to me and just want to talk. I, I spoke with a, uh, he's a doctor who, um, he's a cardiologist in Idaho. And he mentioned a movie with Will Farrell that was out a number of years ago, where he's stranger than fiction. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and it was very interesting how, you know, that's, very similar themes worked out in there because again in that film there's 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 an author who is who always writes stories where there's a dramatic death uh-huh. and <laughs> that's right <laughs> this individual begins to he's a he's a tax collector begins to realize that oh my goodness there's a narration going on and and so then they weave through yeah. that they weave through yeah. some of those issues what what captured me about this on so many levels was that pastorally the um what you noticed here about karma you know i can't believe in god because i can't believe god would have a reason to allow these seemingly arbitrary cruel and perhaps capricious things to happen to people that this god professes he loves but Mm -hmm. then again in an impersonal space um well I can imagine how this tragic instance here could in the future produce something good. And so mm-hmm. the critical the, the critical turn there is personhood. That mm-hmm. a a a omniscient omnipotent person could not allow this here, but a mechanistic uh, a, a mechanism could allow this here. And so where this got interesting for me is -hmm. that over the last year and a half through Jordan Peterson, Jonathan Peugeot, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the work of John Verveke, cognitive science, this so much of contemporary philosophy right now and, and conversations of metaphysics seem to be narrowing down into these questions of what is a person? Mm-hmm. What is a subject? How does the subject fit into the overall picture? And as I began to look at this, it's like, well, isn't it interesting that we have a that we have a generation of individuals naively tripping on the very same subject that all kinds of nerdy philosophers <laughs> are wrangling with. Uh-huh. And and then part of what, again, drew me to you was I, I saw what you were dealing with. And, of course, the problem of evil comes up. But in my pastoral experience, I, 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 I began to have a suspicion that it, it wasn't necessarily so much the presence of evil, mm-hmm. but it was far more the dynamics of trust that mm-hmm. were at play in individuals as they were working through these issues of, can I believe in a God? And, mm-hmm. and, and then I also noticed in your conversation with Hank Hanegraaff, which I thought those two conversations were, were very helpful, mm-hmm. you, you also begin to dive into this question of person. Because mm-hmm. obviously, I, I actually just had a conversation with a guy who, he was raised in a this sounds weird, but they're out there, a conservative Unitarian congregation. Huh. And that does they sound weird. <laughs> that's right. They didn't believe in the Trinity, but in almost all other aspects, they were sort of like Southern Baptists. Huh. So his, his, his morality was, was very much in alignment with conservative evangelicals. And so he was just kind of going through life because his church was very small, kind of going through life, passing as a conservative evangelical until someone, it would somehow come up that maybe he'd join a church and then he'd look at the church's statement, which was this boilerplate evangelical, and mm-hmm. they have this thing about the Trinity, and he says, oh, by the way, that that Trinity thing, I, I don't buy that. Mm-hmm. And suddenly all the clergy are like, 
you know, if he was <laughs> pro-abortion, well, right. you know, and, and if he, you know, wanted to sleep with his girlfriend before marriage, I mean, the evangelical church sort of has their routine to deal with that. Right. And then he says, I, I'm totally down with everything the church is about except the Trinity. Right. <laughs> He, and, of course, the pastors are just kind of sucker punched because <laughs> right. suddenly they're going to have to try. And I had a conversation with him. And I'll probably have some more because he basically says, he says, look, how does the doctrine of the Trinity make any difference for life as mm-hmm. pass for a conservative evangelical today? Why would that matter? Mm-hmm. And so at the same time, I'm having doing all of this work about personhood, about agency, about metaphysics and saying, well, isn't it interesting that that the the largest question of the it's not just it's not just evangelicals, it's Roman Catholics of many people raised religion. They're defecting from the church over this issue of personhood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> So what? So let me ask you this question, and and this is also right now technologically a very interesting thing because of you know the Turing test, where at what point is a person is a computer so sophisticated that they are indistinguishable from a human being to a human being, mm-hmm. and so we have so a lot of the conversations I've been having with Jonathan Peugeot, who grew up evangelical, and then went over to orthodoxy, a lot of the conversations I'm, I've been having with him actually get into this question of principalities, powers, persons, mm-hmm. um, and then you get into very interesting questions of ontology with respect to spiritual beings and you know the, the reality of God. So let me ask you this question. What is a person? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, be- before I answer that question, I just want to offer a note on, on Stranger Than Fiction. I think Stranger Than Fiction is a fascinating juxtaposition with life itself. Because in life itself, life itself is this abstract and personal karma fate. Whereas Stranger Than Fiction actually is the dilemma of a person. And I'm actually okay with giving some spoilers. Uh, fast forward, I guess, if you don't want to hear spoilers. But Stranger Than Fiction's been out long enough that I think expiration date has expired on if you want it. <laughs> right. So, um, of course, one of the things that's fascinating is as, um, as Will Ferrell's character realizes that his life is being narrated and, and it seems that he's bound by fate by whatever this narrator is doing, um, he eventually figures out who the author is, who doesn't know that she's actually controlling the life of Will Ferrell. And he ends up uh, tracking her down and having this conversation. And basically he asks her to not kill him because he's figured out that this is where uh, this story is going. And she goes into this massive crisis. How many people have I killed? You know, can I kill this person? And, and, And so on. And what I think is fascinating about this is, um, there's a third character here, which is this literature professor who Will Ferrell is consulting with, which is part of how he figured out who the author was. Uh, And, and that person, right, that, that, you know, literature uh, professor ends up reading the manuscript, right? She, she gives him the manuscript uh, before she's sort of really, you know, written the final chapter where he would die. And, um, and the literature professor takes a look at it and he's read it and reread it. And he basically says, bad news, you have to die. Like this is the most ingenious thing of her illustrious career. And, you know, it's important that you die. Right. Um, And we're all going to die someday. So why not in this way? Um, You know, because it's, it's just too important from a literary perspective to abandon it. So it's this fascinating thing that he's really suggesting there is almost this best possible world's outcome here where death has to be the thing that happens. And yet, um, and this would be the spoiler part. Okay. Just pause there so they can, you know, uh, so, uh, so the, uh, the author ends up changing the ending so that he doesn't die. And, um, then the literature professor looks at it and says, well, it's not as good, right? Like it's not, I mean, it's, it's all right. You know, it's not as good. But he didn't die, and her rationale is, you know, well, he's he seems like a good man, and that's not the sort of man you would want to kill, right? Okay, 
But what's fascinating there is the irony is a big part of this other component. I think you rightly pointed out the component of trust, right? That that's one of the issues that's in there. I think the other issue, which is another ancient philosophy problem, is the question of the passions, right? So the passions, we tend to not really know what the proper roots of those terms are, but the passions in ancient literature were basically your animal impulses. Uh, and they're pre-volitional animal impulses, right? So like in Stoic philosophy, you have uh, an animal impulse to uh, react defensively, say, when there's a physical threat. And we might call that, a, you know, uh, let's say it, it, that prompts what we call anger. You know, the Stoics would suggest you're not actually angry until your will engages. Once your will engages with that animal reaction, that physiological response to an external threat, now you're angry, right? Because anger is a volitional activity, not a pre-volitional physiological reaction. Uh, and, and I think that's an, a fascinating point because really when the Stoics talk about cultivating apathy, right, apatheia, they don't mean uh, what I see in many of my students, which is that I don't care about this class and why am I here? Uh, what <laughs> what they see instead, what they mean instead, is that you have cultivated a gap between impulse and reaction. You've created the room necessary so that your will can assess whether uh, a physiological response is in keeping with the good or not. So if it's appropriate to be angry here because this is a genuine injustice or something like that. Uh, then uh, that volitional engagement would be appropriate and good. But sometimes we have uh, physiological reactions where, you know, you are inclined to be angry with your kids and they really don't deserve that, right? It was, it was, they didn't mean to drop that 25 pound weight on your toe. It was an accident, <laughs> right? Um, and so, so, you know, there's, there's an appropriate, get, and that's the whole point is that the Stoics presume that the pre-volitional you know, impulse of the passion sometimes aligns with the good, sometimes doesn't. And apathia is the cultivation of this gap where the will is capable of saying yes or no to the passions. That's apathia or apathy. Um, and the reason that's important is because when it comes to the question of God, impassibility is the doctrine uh, that was taught by uh, the Christians, but also was held uh, by you know most of ancient philosophy that God, not having an animal body, not being an organism, doesn't have passions. Uh, so the question of good and evil uh, is not you know is not a question for God of impulse uh, or you know desire in the sort of animal sense or anything like that. And they saw this as critical to again trust in God. Right, that God is uh, God is impassable. Now, what I think is fascinating is that the nuns seems to the nuns who are inclined toward karma and faith seem to intu intuitively get that the justice and trusting karma and fate. It's critical that that force is uh, dispassionate, right? Because they recognize that passions can lead to miscalculation, injustice, so on. But the irony is, stranger than fiction, the passions win. Uh, so the irony is there you do have a human author and the human author can't follow through with what is apparently the good, right? We could talk about whether or not that's viable, right? That certain evils like killing a man is good. But, but the point is what we do have in the film is we have a setup where uh, the literature professor has said, this is the best ending. This is what must happen, right? And the author just can't bring herself to do the good because of the sway of the passions. Um, and so that's interesting. I find that a fascinating juxtaposition uh, with with life itself. So yes, yes, uh, I think you've set up well the question of of the person of God. Because mm -hmm. If you would, you know, it, it's so funny when you say that because I also find in contemporary culture, I mean, in a, you've also set up in a sense the the old controversy of Athens versus Jerusalem mm -hmm. in that. The God that we find in the Hebrew scriptures is he's he's moved again and again. You have mm -hmm. Hosea, you know, you know, Ephraim, you know, who I love. How mm -hmm. can I? And you have and, and the psalmist is is wrestling with God and in the desert wanderings, you have Moses and God. And, and sometimes they seem to trade places. God's like, all right, I'm done. I'm going to smite him. And Moses like, no, 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 no. And sometimes <laughs> Moses like, wipe him out. And God's like, oh, right. come on. And 
and of course, this is this is not the unmoved mover you find from Aristotle. Sure. And, yeah. And, but but I would I would guess that when I look at when I look at say people who are happily and passionately evangelical in a personal relationship and especially Pentecostal, um, you know, they love God's passion. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, yeah. and, they, and, and in fact, they couldn't cultivate this personal relationship with God if they would imagine God to be an unmoved mover. Yeah. Well, and I do think that comes through not just in Pentecostals. I think it came through in, um, well, I used to be a process philosopher, right? And the process philosophers, once they, I mean, initially with Alfred North Whitehead and people like Charles Hartshorn, uh, they were not so interested in the Bible, you know, you know, Christian uh, process philosophy, but it became more and more um, interesting to uh, biblical scholars, for example. So Robert Neuss, uh, is one of the process philosophers in Old Testament studies. Uh, Terence Fretheim, Lutheran uh, process philosopher as well, um, who wrote this book, The Suffering of God. And these were books that I always loved um, in, in that time in my life. But a lot, of, a lot of it was that they recognized that the sort of language that you're talking about in the Old Testament uh, is you know, dealt with in what they felt was a sort of run rough shot over. We can't, we just sort of deny that those things are in there and get rid of them. Uh, they didn't feel there was a genuine dealing with these aspects of the Judeo Christian God. Uh, and, but what you could also tell was coming through was they weren't just trying to take the, that imagery more seriously and say that it's real and it's really saying what it thinks it, it looks like it's saying God really does change his mind and God really does weigh, you know, love and is you know, swayed by his passions, right, or something like that, right, this passable God that they seem to introduce. It seemed that for them that was critical to being able to embrace and love God. Right, so you almost have this juxtaposition where, on the one hand, you have the folks who their main hang-up is trusting God, and they need to get over that hurdle, and the best way to do it is to have God dispassionate and even impersonal. And then you have the other folks who really just want to know that God loves them, and the only way they can feel that is to, to, because they associate love with swells of emotion and feelings, uh, they can't imagine a God who loves without those swells of emotions and feelings. So they embrace, to the contrary, a very personal and very passionate God who may well be swayed by, you know, feelings, right? S- similar to Stranger Than Fiction. Um, and so I think that's a, such a fascinating contrast because I think you have in some ways, they're all dealing with, as you pointed out, ancient philosophical questions, right? There's nothing new on the sun in terms of these types of questions, if you're familiar with ancient literature and the philosophers. Um, and by the philosophers, I'd include the Christian philosophers. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, you have this uh, pendulum swing happening where it seems that the need for the passionate personal God was something that was sort of a fad, I don't know how many years ago, but I'd say, you know, Fretheim and those, that was kind of a 90s trend that I think started to level off. And then you had the nuns come in and that was a very different, and that was the opposite side of that pendulum. So I, I think the topics they're dealing with are, are old topics um, and the dichotomy <laughs> that they're swinging between are um, both, you know, what, what the ancients would have considered two ditches on either side of the right road. Um, but nonetheless, there it is. Um, okay, so in terms of personhood, <laughs> divine personhood. Okay, so I mean, as usual, uh, I'll speak from an, uh, an Eastern patristic, Eastern Orthodox sort of perspective on these things. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's fascinating is that the question of personhood uh, is something that really wasn't dealt with as much by the ancient philosophers prior to Christianity. And it was things like Trinitarian theology and Christology that prompted all of these Eastern fathers to realize, boy, we really need this other thing called a person, right? A subject, a hypothesis. Um, and I'll talk about their solution in a second. But what I think is fascinating is in the West where a lot of the sort of solutions that were, you know, fleshed out in the East, um, you know, essence energies distinctions, the the hypothesis who see a distinction. In the West, it seems like there's a lack of clarity on some of those critical distinctions that were crucial to how Eastern theology understood itself and, and developed. 
Whereas in the West, you have certain people like Augustine, who in his De Trinitate, he says about person, right? He says, well, we don't really know what person means, right? So he's taking, and here he's taking the Latin translation of hypostasis into persona and saying, well, we don't really know what that is. And a lot of the treatise is just him trying to come up with an acceptable uh, definition of what uh, a persona is. Uh, that seems to be Nicene. But Augustine admits early on in the treatise, he says, well, I'm sure, this is one of my favorite parts of this entire treatise, massive uh, De Trinitare is a massive treatise. Uh, he says at the beginning, he says, well, I'm sure you can find the answers to any questions you might have about the Trinity in the Eastern, uh, in the Greek fathers. But most of us over here don't read Greek well enough to know what they're saying. So I'm just going to have to rely on God. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a shocking admission, right? Like you'd think, really? wow. <laughs> I'm just going to reinvent the wheel, huh? Okay. Um, all right. So that's what I find so fascinating about that treatise is because it has that level of admission that I'm kind of, I've got some basic terminology from, you know, from a council, but I really, I really don't understand the nuances of what the Greek guys are doing. Uh, and so Augustine fleshes that out. And one of the things he arrives at is a person's as relations. Uh, and I could talk about why that is that has to do with a uh, heavy influence from Neoplatonism on Augustine and his belief that you know, um, I, I would say his extreme realism as opposed to moderate realism. Um, I, would, I won't get too bogged down in those terms, but I do think it's an important difference between East and West, which is that uh, in sort of Aristotelian moderate realism versus Platonic extreme realism, uh, those that distinction is really between, uh, is really about this. Uh, both Plato and Aristotle presume that the categories we use of the mind, right? When we say that this object is red and that object is red and that object is red, right? The question about realism versus nominalism uh, is the question of, well, is that category of thing, right? That general noun that we've just used, that universal, which becomes the medievalist, you know, sort of way of talking about it, um, where I've said red, 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 is that just um, a fabrication of the mind? My mind can't, oh, there, in reality, there are only particulars, right? That red is not that red is not that red, and they share nothing in common. They're all individual, discrete, you know, instances. Um, very, everything's a unique snowflake, so to speak. Uh, and the mind looks at those, and because it needs to group things, I create a name and a false fabricated mental group, and I say red. But that's not real. It's just mental. I project redness onto this thing that I have associated with red. That's right. And it's just a way of sort of mentally grouping things, but the groups aren't real, right? That's nominalism. And it's called nominalism uh, from nomen, right? Name, right? The Latin for name, uh, nomenclature, right? Uh, and we, uh, and, and it's a name we've assigned, but it's not real outside of the mind. Realism says, no, 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 no. Um, these categories of genera and species uh, and, you know, other properties, uh, these are real outside of the mind. And the reason your mind says that's the same thing as that is because that's the same thing as that. <laughs> that's why it's called realist. Right? In other so words, they, the mind is perceiving something external from itself and and actually, the, even the groupings are coming from the things out there. They're not simply being projected onto them. That's right. Um, so you and I are human. And the reason the mind looks at you and says, oh, that's a human, looks at me, says, uh, is because we actually are both participating in this thing, the singular thing called humanity, right? That's a real thing we both have or participate in or something. Right. So now the differences in real. So that's the basic divide between nominalism. Are these categories and groups real uh, or not? Nominalism says, no, they're not real. They're mental. Uh, realism says, yes, they're real. And your mind does that because they're real. Now, then within realism, you get into this um, divide, which I won't get sidetracked with. I'll just say I think it's a little artificial of a divide. I think they're underdefined terms, uh, but you're listeners probably don't need to know the nuances of this, but the basic divide that's often presented is realism versus, uh, or extreme realism versus moderate realism. So you're familiar with the, um, 
the painting of a uh, Raphael school of Athens painting where you have in the middle Plato and Aristotle. Yep. <laughs> and if you're familiar with it, yep, there it is. Right. So that's, that's exactly what it is, right? Plato's going and Aristotle's <laughs> going. And, um, and the reason they're doing that is cause that's Raphael's very simple, but very precise way of saying the question is when you talk about these groups, right? These genera and species, what um, would also be called forms, right? The question is, where are they? And Plato says, the forms. And Aristotle says, the forms, right? And this, this is the basic difference between realism, or extreme realism and moderate realism. So extreme realism says, um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll use, I, I happen to have here, three of the same type of thing. So these are all <laughs> rapers. Uh, just one shop. And, you know, I, I got to <laughs> this part. So, um, so Plato would say, why do you look at this one and say it's a razor? And you look at this one and say it's a razor. And you look at this one and say it's a razor. And Plato would say somewhere, somewhere you've got this perfect ideal archetypal form of razorness, right? And then when you encounter material copies, so these are material, so this one is immaterial, it's an ideal substance, it's perfect, you know, in every way. It's um, an ideal substance. Right, it is an ideal substance. Okay. Uh, and then what we have is the demiurg, the demiurgus, yep. right, the demiurge, yep. the, uh, the crafter, which is yep. Plato's god, crafts the world, and it's a material copy of a bunch of, archetypal ideal substances, right? The forms. Uh, and so somewhere there's the ideal, you know, razor, and then the demiurge crafts material copies. And we look at this and we go, oh, that's a razor because it looks like this. That's a razor because it looks like this, right? In other words, whenever you see something, you go through a catalog of forms you've seen and you approximate which one it looks the most like. And that's why uh, and I think this is a fascinating thing to note in Plato's favor is that when you encounter something that is decayed and rotten, your first question is, what is it? And it's not because you don't have enough light to see it with your eyes. It's because your mind actually sees things. Your eyes see it just fine. There's light, shatter, texture, whatever it is. But your mind is saying it doesn't fit any of the forms. What is it? Right, and this is why Plato talks about that the good of a thing is the closer it gets to its archetype, right? The more it looks like it, that's its good, and then when it diverges, that's its evil, right? And that's what we call uh, generation, right? Conforming to your archetype, corruption, moving away from it, decaying, rotting, uh, and so on. Um, anyway, Aristotle says, well, that, that entire view is problematic because, and his critique, I think the simplest critique to offer, he offers like five in his, uh, in his writings. But, you know, there's the, I think the simplest one to offer um, is just the third man problem. So Aristotle says, okay, so these, are, these material razors are razors because they look like this. Why is that a razor? And he's, and he says, well, if what makes this thing a razor is that it looks like this thing, do we need another razor and another razor and that we keep on referring back to? So Aristotle thinks that's a, uh, that's a problematic um, understanding of uh, realism. So Aristotle's conclusion is that abstract definitions, right? And, you know, when we say, what is a circle? It's not that there's an actual shape of a circle, an ideal you know, form of circle somewhere, and then we look at it. Clearly, we do do this comparative thing that Plato is talking about, where we say that's a good circle and that's a bad circle. And we are comparing it in some way to how well it conforms to something. But Aristotle's uh, presumption is that the, the ideal is really the basic definition. Right. These are abstract de uh, definitions. A uh, circle is a two-dimensional geometric shape with flowing circumference. All points are in equal distance from a common center, and so on. Um, but that doesn't have any concrete existence until it manifests in matter. And basically, let's see. I always this is I think the best way for me. Uh, I need to grab a piece of fabric. Hold on. Give me one second. No problem. All right.
ready to perform my magic. <laughs> All right. So Aristotle's relationship is Aristotle introduces a distinction between matter and form. Obviously, Plato distinguished matter from form, but Plato's matter seems kind of like amorphous clay, right? It sort of has substances. Whereas Aristotle's insight, which I think is an intriguing insight, is that um, he said the problem is even if we take an amorphous blob of something, let's say it's like uh, clay, so the problem is clay has properties already, and these are already forms or universals or repeatable properties like density and shape and mass and things like that. And so he says the problem is you've already got form and you've already got form inside of it, if if even if it's amorphous, right? And so Aristotle's conclusion is what matter is, what matter truly is, once you get past like basic elements and things like that, is just the potential to be something. Uh, matter is pure potential. It is nothing in itself. It is just potentially something. And the way uh, this ends up playing out in terms of realism is that Aristotle's presumption is that any concrete object, any object whatsoever, doesn't matter how basic or amorphous or anything it is, is a combination of matter uh, and form. It's a it's hylomorphic, right? Which is hule from, which is the uh, the Greek for matter, and morphe, which is the Greek for form, right? So it's a hylomorphic something, and the question is, what are the forms that it has? And so the idea is, you know, we can imagine that this is Aristotelian matter, right? It's potentially spherical. It's potentially, you know, cubical. It's potentially takes on a human shape. Um, and basically how that potential is realized is, you know, you take a shape, right, uh, something like that, and you actually, like, put it inside of it, and voila, right, that form is now concretely manifest in the matter. And Aristotle would point out the form doesn't actually belong to the matter. It's manifest in the matter, but the matter is not actually the shape. It's just taken on the shape. Uh, the shape belongs to the thing that's communicating in that. And so Aristotle would say that the forms right? Uh, the abstract natures that we identify that the mind abstracts from matter. That's what the word abstraction means. The mind perceives something there, takes it out of it, and now it's, you know, in the mind. Um, he suggests, well, that's, that's what's going on there, right? That's communi that, that form has taken up residence inside of matter, and that's why matter now concretely manifests that property. But that's also, and that's what generation is, right? So generation, whenever you're talking about a plant growing, or a fetus growing, or whatever it is, uh, it's, the it's the draping process, right? It's matter has had a form put into it, and it's starting to conform to that and manifest it concretely. Um, abnormalities, corruptions, or things like that are things where the matter hasn't properly manifest the form. Uh, and corruption, in the sense of you know, generation moving into being corruption is the process of removing the form from the matter and it going back to potentially something. So that's Aristotelian uh, moderate realism in a nutshell. And so that's, that's kind of the basic difference. Um, all right. So uh, two forms of realism there, moderate realism, extreme realism. And uh, one of the problems you ran into, now that all of this was a backdrop to say that one of the things that the Western medievals eventually started to realize, uh, specifically John Duns Scotus was a critical one in this, was they started to realize, you know what? Reality in the way we talk is 100% about forms. It's about universals. So what is an individual? And they realized that their entire philosophy whether it was extreme realist or it was moderate realist, the only things that were real were universals, repeatable properties. But the individual seemed to be something unique and non-repeatable. It seems kind of weird and counterintuitive to suggest that there can be a second Nathan, right? Uh, or Dr. Jacobs, right? Whatever, uh, Nathan Jacobs, right? Um, or that there can be a second Paul. Now, we can imagine there being a replica of you that looks exactly like you in every way and we're confused just like in every, you know, sci-fi movie where we don't know which one's the clone and which one's real, right? Um, you know, but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's still intuitive that there's not two of you, right? One of them is not you. Which one is the real Paul, right? Like that's always the dilemma that starts to emerge here, right? How do we figure out that? And 
And so the problem was, uh, you know, SCOTUS in particular thought it's really problematic, you know, if we're going to say, for example, well, what makes it, what makes it you, you, the individual is that it's this particular lump of matter. And SCOTUS is like, matter isn't really a thing. And then we've already introduced something that's not universal because we've just, we're sort of begging the question, right, this particular lump of matter. Um, if we say it's the exact combination of properties, like it's just this unique combination of properties, we open the door to this oddity that you could replicate the individual. Um, you know, and so, uh, and, and then the alternative was suggesting like, well, maybe we go into this, this, maybe the alternative is that it's this unique set of properties, which includes everything that's ever happened historically and spatially, right? So we're um, a super essentialist, right? Where every property is essential to you. Um, but that gets you into this weird counterintuitive thing, like, really, I, I couldn't have been born at a different time, right? Like, right. I couldn't have done, because now you're getting into determinism questions. So if right. I didn't do that, I wouldn't be me. Right. Uh, and all of these things seem to be intuitively problematic. And so SCOTUS ends up coming up with what he calls hexaetas, right? Which is basically the thisness of the thing. And he introduces what's the one non-repeatable property, right? And so what is hexaetas? Hexaetas is the property of being this and not that. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, it, and interestingly, Scotus does this partially because he says, I don't know if we could even have a trinity without having that as a, a feature of reality. And the reason Scotus recognizes this is because when individuals are products of, let's say, an extreme realism, how do you get multiple individuals of, of the same type? Well, you need matter, right? Because there's only one of the ideal. Now we get multiple of that individual by making material copies. Okay, well, how do you get, you know, multiple? Okay, so let's say we get rid of that and we go with moderate realism. Well, you still need matter in order to do that because matter, you, know, you stick them in there, right? That's how you get multiple of the same kind. And Scotus recognized, well, in this, in Trinitarian theology, you have God who's above matter. And so if you say God's a form, right, a pure form, like he's the form of the good, for example, uh, then you've got the problem that you can't have more than one of him. Uh, and so you have the Trinitarian problem, which incidentally, this is sort of the basis of why Augustine's like, I don't know what a person is, because he's an extreme realist and God is the form of the good. And so how he can't, he can't, there can't be multiple individuals because there's no matter up there, right? Once you get up to the forms, your past matter, all this. Um, so that's part of Augustine's problem. Uh, Boethius recognized the same problem. Boethius, incidentally, in terms of Western treatise, treatises on the Trinity, Boethius is my favorite hmm. because he goes through all the same problems that Augustine goes <laughs> through and then explains why he can't get to a Trinity and then basically says, yeah, so basically none of my solutions work, so I, I hope you found this treatise helpful. <laughs> like, okay. I appreciate your honesty there. Buddy. Um, anyway, uh, but, but, and so SCOTUS is recognizing matter is not an option. Multiple forms are not an option. And so the only solution SCOTUS can come up with is that there is a form or a nature or essence, God. Um, and there are three discrete individuals that have a three uh, three discrete instances of hexaetas, right, that have that nature. And since hexaetas is not matter, nor is it a conglomeration of forms, all of which would be problematic from, you know, theological perspectives, because God is simple, right? He's not a conglomeration of anything. Um, and, uh, and he's not material, right? All of those things are off the table. Scotus says hexaetas is the only real solution to this, uh, to this Trinitarian dilemma. Now, the reason I go through all that, because Scotus is sort of late medieval scholastic, right? Um, he's not an early writer, you know, in Western theology, is because I think Scotus is the one who gets you closest to, to what you've already got going on in all those Eastern writers earlier. So um, to jump back, this has been a very long aside. I, I love you... it. I love it. I just keep going. My, okay. uh, a part of my channel is going to eat this up. Okay. Well, great. <laughs> because of course there's the Jordan Peterson stuff that kind of launched me, but a lot of people are following the work of John Verveke and he has this, he's doing this 50 part YouTube series on 
cognitive science and all this stuff. So okay. keep going. Great. Okay. So jumping back then to the Eastern writers, um, the basic formulation that you have when, in the Trinitarian discussions, uh, when the, the Nicene Constantinople discussions, um, is, is this, this term hypostasis and the question being, what does that term mean? Okay. So by way of context here, what you have is in the initial discussion between Athanasius of Alexandria and Arius of Alexandria at Nicaea, the first question is just, we've got, we've got these two different individuals, right? We've got God, and then we've got this son of God that's shown up. And pretty much by this point, everybody's, nobody's really going, you know, I think the real solution is Sabellianism and they're not different. Like everybody's sort of been past that. We're like, no, we know that's not right. They're definitely different. Um, but then the question is, are, are, do, are they the same type of thing, right? Or do they have the same nature? And this is the homo usia, right? Usia being one, one of the many terms uh, for nature or essence, uh, what would, universal, right? Uh, repeatable uh, property sort of thing, universal, um, like human. Uh, so is, are they homoousia, right? Or, or are they homoousia? And basically Athanasius is saying they're homoousia. They are the same type of thing, just like Paul and Nathan are the same type of thing. They're both human. And Arius is saying they're homoousia, which is basically to say they're kind of alike. You know, the son of God's really God-like. You know, very powerful, but he's a creature, right? And this is Arius' basic dis distinction uh, here. And basically, uh, Nicaea is all about saying Arius is wrong. No, they are the same type of thing. The Son of God is divine, right? He is God. Um, now, just as an aside there, one of the reasons I say divine is because I think a big part of the confusion in contemporary Western discussions about the Trinity is most people use the word God to mean an individual, which is very New Testament um, when you talk about God, right? You're talking about God the Father, you're talking about this individual. With the Greek writers, they had an advantage where they could drop the definite article and, and right. to indicate what they mean, right? So, um, so definite articles, indefinite articles, which you didn't have, right? You just didn't have the definite article. Um, you could say hatheos, and we now know we're talking about God the Father, an individual concrete you know, mm -hmm. person, which we haven't defined, uh, or we drop it as just theos, and now it's the divine nature. It's an abstract nature, and we can use it as a predicate. So when we say that the Son is God, really, I think the problem is by using just God in both instances in English, it's misleading because we don't have that way of dropping the definite article. So I think it's actually closer to say things like um, they're saying, you know, Jesus is divine, just like God is. And by God there, you mean the father. Um, anyway, uh, but no, it's a big, that's a big deal. It is big. Deal. It is a big deal. Right. Um, Cause I think it's a big part of the confusion. I think a lot yes. of people in Trinitarian discussions are thinking somehow you've got three guys who you're collapsing into one guy. And I'm trying to figure out how this fourth guy is three guys. There's no fourth guy. Uh, <laughs> and that's a big part of the, the confusion. Uh, so anyway, um, but then at Constantinople, one of the issues you're running into is um, you're running into the question of, well, okay, so like, what does that mean to say that you've got two and they're both uh, God? And this is where I find these first opening discussions, right? These first two councils to be fascinating in terms of what they tell you about how the Eastern church fathers and ancients generally think about language. Um, they, uh, one of the things that I think is very different about the way the ancients think and the way a lot of contemporary people think is that the ancients very clearly don't indigenize words and ideas. Hmm. Uh, and what I mean by that is we have such a tendency uh, in our sort of anthropology you know, but having been influenced by anthropology and sociology to tend to indigenize ideas. That's a Greek idea. And that's a Jewish idea. And that's a Chinese idea. I don't know, you know, pick whatever it is, but you indigenize ideas. And, um, and I think one of the things that's fascinating is that in the ancient world, um, they don't do that, right? Uh, first of all, in terms of language itself, they tend to see language as signposts, right? So, you know, if I had a marker, I'd write the word, uh, you know, God on my hand, 
right? And you could, you know, point it to that, right? And they'd be like, nope, that's a misapplied signpost, right? That's no God at all, right? And so you'd have that. But the whole point is, at the end of the day, they don't really care what's written on the signpost. They're not talking about the signpost. They're concerned about this thing, right? Um, and, and you see this, for example, in, uh, in the very homo sea discussion, right? If ever there was going to be an insistence that the signpost is what really matters, it would be in the homo sea versus homo eusia. But people like Basil of Caesarea, you know, talking after Nicaea, actually says, I don't have a problem with homo eusia as a word. Uh, and what he means is he says, oh, sometimes you'll say that two things are like, and you mean they're exactly the same. <laughs> and he says, so he says, so at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with the word. The problem is what Arius meant by it, right? And so here he's saying, like, the word is not the problem. Like, this signpost could be used to point to either same type of thing or not same type of thing. Uh, and the problem is Arius was using it to point to not the same type of thing. So we'll go ahead and just like from now on, we only use that as a bad word that only points to the not same type of thing. But I mean, you could point it to that and it'd be fine, but we'll, we'll do that. And the same thing happens in the uh, Constantinople discussion. So uh, the terms hupasis and usia, right? So anybody who's familiar with Trinitarian theology, you have three something and one something. Uh, typically translated like three persons and one, you know, nature or substance or essence, um, depending on who's doing the translating. And those are all based on the Latin uh, equivalents of these terms. But the Greek terms that are being used in this discussion are hypostasis and usia. And one of the things that's interesting is hypostasis and usia are synonyms uh, prior to Constantinople in just Greek language generally. So, um, Usia, what is the pre-Constantinople uh, definition of Usia? Well, it could in, rep, refer to an individual, Nathan, uh, a species, human, or a genus, animal. Right? What's the pre-Constantinople definition of hypostasis? Could point to an individual, Nathan, <laughs> to a species, human, or to a genus, animal. Um, and what happens is, Basil actually says, Basil of Caesarea says in one of his letters, he says, oh, and no, everybody's totally confused. Nobody knows what anybody's talking about because <laughs> some people are talking about three hypostas and three, you know, one, you know, some people are talking about three hypostas, some are talking about three usia, some people are talking about one usia, some people are talking about three hypostas. Nobody knows, nobody knows what anybody's saying. And even what's fascinating here is a historical note, Nicaea actually anathematizes Anybody who says that there are three, more than one usia or more than one hypostasis. Now, they're anathematizing that because they're recognizing these are equivalent terms for the nature or essence. And they've just said that Arius is wrong and the son and the father have the same nature. There's only one nature that they share. So you can't say that that's not true. Well, then what happens in Constantinople, they end up saying, right, what would be anathematized <laughs> under Constantinople, which is that there's three hypostases. But that's because they've changed the meaning of the word, right? So Basil actually says, from now on, forget it, we will never again use the word usia in any other way than to mean the, you know, the nature, right, the species or the genus, species or the genus, and hypostasis from now on only means the individual. And that way, everybody's clear. And you see this definitive change in language, um, which is fascinating. I, I think this is fascinating to see the fluidity of, of, of the language there. And, um, and that they don't sort of see that they recognize the difference between the words you're using and what they're pointing to. Right. right? And I think that's something that's getting lost. We're so uh, attuned to branding and marketing. Though, isn't it? Well, I, I think it's, uh, I don't know. I don't think I would say it's nominal. Uh, because at the end of the day, what the concern is, is that there's something real, right? I, I would say they're, they're concerned with the fact that underneath the words, there's something real. And I think this is the big, I, incidentally, I'd say in a lot of the contemporary discussions, what's intuitively at play is a divide in political discussions, social discussions. There's a divide between people who really are nominalists, right? They really do think that um, when they say that certain things like, you know, you Pick, pick your uh, soup du jour of contemporary disputes, right? When they, they say this is a social con construct or that is a social construct, what they mean is 
society or mind or language or whatever has drawn a fence around something, but the fence isn't real. Right. And they're dominoless. And other people are going, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's real. <laughs> and, and I think that's really what you see. What you see in the contemporary society is an absolute rift between realists and nominalists. Um, and incidentally, I'll just say uh, one of the reasons, I mean, when, whenever I'm talking to people about religious epistemology and why do you believe this or that, uh, for me, realism is actually one of the basic starting points. So it's not as if I start with Bible and then I go there. One of the you know, uncompromising uncom- features uh, in my worldview is realism. And the reason is because I think nominalism is unlivable. Um, because all you have to do is wait for a nom- there's I, I can't even find a way to articulate nominalism without contradicting myself, right? So <laughs> there are only individuals, not universals. Well, I've just made individual into a universal category, right? Uh, there are only, there's just material objects, not, okay, well, I've just said matter is this thing that I, all, they all participate. Like, there's no way of really articulating it. And even reason itself, logic itself, sorry for this aside, but... Um, logic itself is based on realism from what I can tell. So when I say, you know, uh, all A's are B's and all B's are C's, therefore all A's are C's, what I'm doing is I'm dealing in groups, right? Um, and, and the problem is you can't make logical argument without those sorts of groupings. Uh, so at the end of the day, if you're going to argue for nominalism, the only way to do it is by employing realism because you're going to do it in a logical fashion. So I think I think nominalism is just incoherent and utterly breaks down and collapses under any level of scrutiny. Um, anyway, putting that aside, back to the uh, <laughs> Constantinople uh, Trinitarian discussion. Um, so what you get in the Trinitarian discussion is an insistence that, you know, what the Trinity is when you're saying... Uh, that, that the Son and the Father are homosia. What you're really saying is that you have um, three discrete individuals, right? Um, and those three individuals have a common nature. Uh, and so, uh, so, you know, as much as everybody's always perplexed by Trinitarian theology and it sounds co- incoherent and nonsensical, give me any example of something that, you know, does that, okay, here, here's the Trinity, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is an individual, this is an individual, that's an individual, and they're all the same type of thing. And I could do that, or I could grab three of my books. If I had a third person here, we could point to us. And in fact, they do do that. Basil of Caesarea in one of his letters, um, does that, you know, you know, we've got the Peter, Paul and James. Yep. That's there. And even Gregory of Nyssa does that in his famous uh, letter to Oblabius who, uh, Oblabius asks him, he goes, like, it sounds like three gods. Uh, because if I understand what a hypostasis is, Peter, you know, Peter, Paul and James, I forget that those are probably not the names he used, uh, but going off hand, he says, Peter, Paul and James, these are, these are, uh, these are three individuals and they're the common nature human. And so that would be, I call these three humans. So we do, do we believe in three gods? Right. And Gregory has a response to that. Um, but I think what's fascinating is the very fact that a believe he's asked that means that's exactly what they mean by that. Cause Gregory doesn't come back and say, no, 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 that's not what those terms mean. He goes on and levels of defense. Why it's not tritheism, um, which indicates, yeah, that's, that's what those terms mean. Um, and so, yeah, pick three apples, pick three roses, go grab three dogs, right? Whatever. There's your, your, uh, Trinity. Now, of course, everybody gets hot and bothered by this because they go, that's, that's tritheism and all this sort of stuff. Uh, basic answer to that in these guys is that they say, uh, no, polytheism believes in, and, and so this is where the Trinitarians end up differentiating themselves from monotheists of a certain kind they say we're not jews right like if you want if you want to talk about jewish monotheism that's not our view uh, we're not that kind of monotheist we're monotheists but not that kind uh and then they'd say and we're not polytheists so they recognize that their trinitarianism is unique uh relative to the other theisms um and the difference they'd say is that polytheists believe that god the word god is a genus and there are multiple species and then multiple individuals within those species. They'd say that's what polytheism is because theos or divinity is multiple. 
right? There are various types of natures that are worthy of the name God, right? Some of these are aquatic, some of these are celestial, so they have different powers, activities, all this. Stuff. They'd say, well, those are all different species of things. And they would say, we don't believe that. We think there's only one nature that's worthy of the name God, right? You're describing things that sound an awful lot like angels or, you know, principalities or powers or something like that. Uh, but that's not God. And so they'd say, you're creature worshipers. You're not like, in, and hence polytheists, because you believe in all these different natures. Uh, we don't believe that. So we side with the monotheists in the sense that there's only one nature worthy of the you know, name God. And we even agree with the Jews about what that nature is like and all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, where we and the Jews differ um, is that the Jews believe only one individual has that nature. Right. And that's the guy who we refer to as God. And he has a name, but I won't say it. And <laughs> you're not supposed to say it. Right. Uh, and, and then um, and but we think God has a son and, you know, he generates the son, he gets the son and he inspires the spirit and uh, all that sort of stuff. So so that's where they'd say. So that's where we're unique, because we think there's three individuals ha who have this nature. Okay. Um, and then, and then in terms of, you know, the big question mark becomes, well, how do you differentiate these individuals? And that's where we go into all the differences between God and creatures in this whole thing. Um, you know, creatures, creatures are materially separated bodies. They're distinguished by things like color and size and location and spatial situation and things like that. And they would say, well, none of that applies to God. Um, and they would say, so, so the thing is you have individuals who are distinct, absolutely distinct, but not separate because separate is a category of spatial, spatial bodies, right? Material bodies. And, uh, you don't have that with God. So you have distinction, not separation, which in terms of logic, math, all that sorts of things that makes complete sense, right? There's distinction without separation all the time in terms of various, uh, real, categories, assuming you think that mathematics are real, which I tend to think they are. Um, so anyway, that's where you get into that uh, sort of that sort of way of doing. Okay, so that's the backdrop for um, Trinitarian theology, which then when you get into Christology also is critical because they're starting to talk about, well, the Son of God then takes on flesh and becomes human. So now you've got a fully God and you've got fully man. And how does this work? And when you look through all the controversies, a lot of what is going on there is there's an attempt to compromise some part of the human nature in order to sort of stick them together, right? So Apollinarianism, well, let's get rid of the human mind, and then like maybe we stick the divine in there, and now we've got our human person, right? Or, or okay, that didn't work. That was condemned as heretical. Uh, so let's let's we get rid of the human will, and so it's uh, we stick the divine in there and they're always trying to replace something. But the thing where they always came back to was that the nature of a thing and the person having it, the individual subject are distinct. Um, and that's where the unity of Christ is. It's not that you need to get rid of some part, right. Of one of the natures so that you can lock them together like a puzzle piece. It's that he has those two natures. And I think Cyril of Alexandria offered perhaps the most helpful analogy for doing this. Uh, contra Nestorius, the heretic Nestorius, um, which was that, uh, which was that he said, "You or me, human persons, uh, we already are individuals who have two very different natures. I can sit here and I can talk about the distinct nature of your soul versus the nature of your body. You know, one is immaterial and subtle and doesn't have mass, and you know." is hairless and is, you know, whatever, doesn't have color, right, whatever. And then I can set up contrary properties, contradictory properties with your body. And Cyril says, but that's no problem because, you know, they're not the same, sub right, they're, they're distinct. Uh, they're distinct natures with contrary properties, but they're held together by in the same individual. And he says, and you know what it's like to have two contrary natures that uh, you harmoniously use without ever thinking about the difference, and they hold together just fine, it's no problem. And he says, that's basically what you're talking about in the person of Christ. It's the person having the two natures that uses them both simultaneously and harmoniously without a problem, just as you do. Um, and it's, so that's why, that's why both natures can be perfectly preserved without, you know, sort of mutilating either one to make room for the other or something like that because it's the person having them uh, that creates the room for that. Uh, 
So anyway, all of that is a backdrop to the question of person, which is very, very long prelude. <laughs> but a good one, a good one. I, th I think it's a terrific one. I think a lot of people will very much appreciate what you just ran through. Well, thanks. I hope so. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think one of the things that you start to find is that there's a critical difference. Um, basically what they're, they're recognizing is that they're, they're saying there's really three components whenever you're talking about an individual, um, any individual, it doesn't have to be a human individual, right? And I think this is part of, part of the problem in the West, person is always the operative term. And because once you introduce personhood, we start to associate it with rationality, thinking, decision-making, free will, and that's partially due to the modernist turn and Descartes, and you know, basically it's defined as a thinking substance, right? Um, you start to have a separate category of person versus individual. Um, whereas for the Eastern uh, Christians, who really did far more work than any of the ancient philosophers before them in, in fleshing out the concept of a hypothesis and what is an individual. You don't really have much philosophical work going on on that because it's not as important in the pagan philosophies. Um, whereas with the Eastern Fathers, basically they don't have a differentiation between this hypothesis and this hypothesis. Hmm. This is an individual and this is an individual. We don't have a separate category for this individual. Now the question becomes, well, so is there no difference between you and a razor? Right? <laughs> no, there's pretty obviously some significant differences between me and a razor. But that's where they would say, those differences come down to the nature that I have. And so this is why they, what they see, what they see going on is that whenever you're dealing with an individual, you have the discrete individual thisness, right, Nathan? You have the material, that belongs to that individual. Now, this is with creatures. They would not assign material to the divine hypotheses. Uh, but you have the, any creature, including angels, uh, they would say, have the material, right, that potential to be something. And that material is what underwrites the possibility of change in us, right? So we change size, we change color, right? Um, we can become virtuous, we can become vicious, right? Well, all these sorts of, you know, we can become stronger, weaker, uh, grow in health, uh, decline in sickness. All of those things are underwritten by matter. And the fact that it can receive and grow in certain properties and diminish and release certain properties. Um, so the individual doesn't change, but the matter that the individual has is what underwrites the possibility of that individual becoming other than what he or she or it currently is. And then the third thing it has is properties. And then here you have sort of subsets, right? You have the essential properties, the things that make it the species that it is, right? So you and I have the essential properties of human, which is bipedal, 10 fingered, two eye, two eared, you know, all this sort of stuff, rationality, um, all of those sorts of things, free will, all of these properties. Um, but then we also have accidental properties, right? These properties that come and go and have nothing to do with the species we are. So we're different colors. Uh, that doesn't matter, right? That's irrelevant. It's accidental. Just as two circles that are, you know, one's orange and one's blue, it doesn't matter, right? They're both circles because uh, color is accidental to them. So in the same way, the color difference between you and me is irrelevant. Um, and, uh, you know, the size difference between us, the location difference between us, all those sorts of things, all of that, uh, you know, and even relational differences, social situations and whatever it is, uh, all of that, it's, it's accidental. Uh, but the real, right, the real properties, uh, there's, there's no, no doubt about the fact that, you know, I have, you know, my size or my mass is a real property. It's just irrelevant to whether I'm human. Um, and so that's where, yeah, so that's what you end up having. The, the discrete individual, which endures underneath all of it, um, the material, which underwrites the potential change to be other than it is. And then the properties that, you know, that basically are in the thing. And those include essential properties, which are there and can't be gotten rid of. And the accidental properties, which come and go uh, because they're irrelevant uh, to what, in fact, we are. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I would say that would be the basic structure. If you were talking about a very basic structure from uh, Eastern Patristic, Eastern Orthodox perspective on what, you know, an 
uh, I'll skip the word person because I think it's too loaded. I think it has too much baggage. Uh, that's what you'd say it is, right? The, the individual. And that's why we can say this is an individual and this is an individual. But when you say, well, does that mean that this has all the same, like, you know, level of dignity that I have or something like that or value that I have or whatever term you want to throw out there. I don't like throwing out rights because I, I think that's a dicey term that's underdefined, but, yeah. um, you know, but, but okay. Is, is there no difference? Well, surely there is, but it's not located in the first point, whether we're individuals nor in the second point that we're material and potentially other, you know, in certain ways than what we are, it's located in the third one. Uh, the essential properties that we have. I'm human and it's not, right? And that's the underlying, that's the, that's the real essential difference between us. Um, and that's where you start to get um, hierarchy differences, the great chain of being sort of stuff, which we could go into uh, if we wanted. But I mean, basically they presume that, you know, uh, animals have uh, certain properties that are superior to the properties of plants and plants have properties that are superior to rocks and humans have um, unique properties that set them apart from the rest of the animals. And they presume that the psalmist is right when, you know, he says that we're created a little lower than the angels. So the angels have properties that are superior to us and so on. So they have this sort of hierarchy of ontology, which again has nothing to do with the first category of hypothesis being an individual second category of matter. We all have that. Um, it all has to do with the third category of what are the properties, essential properties we have, what is our nature? And that's what underlies, you know, underwrites all of that. So when we come down back to our Turing test and when we come back to this question of nuns who are trying to, they are trying to locate themselves in the great scheme of things and they are trying to lo they are positing an unreliable narrator they are <laughs> positing an author mm -hmm. um, yeah. i mean because what again what what fascinates me about the nuns to bring this all the way back to where we started is mm -hmm. that the so one of the things i was thinking about this morning when i was thinking about this conversation and this topic we were going to have it's interesting that the nuns on one hand would say in, let's say in the movie life itself, mm -hmm. um, I can, I can tolerate and understand and even, an, even affirm a, an impersonal script writer that would in a sense, justify a horrendous tragedy that seems at the moment to be wasteful, pointless and arbitrary mm -hmm. or a good that, is achieved later, even mm -hmm. though, quite frankly, we, we it, the, I mean, the, the categories get very strange when they imagine that because there's authorship going on there. And when I looked at the movie, I thought, well, that's a lovely thing for human beings who possess agency, <laughs> imagine ourselves as authors to say, wow, an impersonal thing just came up with this thing. Right. There's, I mean, there's a lot going in here. And so, and, and a function of this seemed to me to be also a question of, of time. And because I think part of what has happened for human beings is that, or in our culture is that consciousness has changed in that, in terms of our, our value system. So to posit a divine agent who witnesses this horrendous, arbitrary thing that any of us would say, a house burning down, a car accident, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that could be avoidable. Right. For some, for some future good that mm -hmm. somehow within the evaluator, because there's always someone who's doing the evaluating, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's exactly this exchange where all of this stuff comes in. Is, mm -hmm. is what kind of a person could God be that would let my uncle die in this fire when mm -hmm. we would imagine send in an angel to just, you know, <laughs> take the cigarette out of his mouth and put it in an ashtray. Right. Right. Yeah. And well, and I think one of the underdefined areas there is what is meant by the term good. And I think it's inherently a utilitarian uh, understanding of good, right? So classical utilitarianism, it measures goodness by pleasure and pain. 
right? So happiness, they're like, well, let's get rid of this abstract term happiness, which had actually a pretty well-defined, you know, meaning in a lot of ancient philosophy and medieval philosophy. Uh, and, and let's just go with straight quantifiable pleasure, pain, right? Good, evil. And, and so utilitarianism tends to say, well, you, wedge, you, you weigh the good or bad of decisions and things like that based on the outcomes of how much it increases pleasure and decreases pain. And then you get into the question of whether the utility, I should be primarily concerned just about my pleasure or pain, my happiness, or the broader you know, society. So it's sort of this you know, um, communal utilitarianism, because looking at life itself, there's very clearly some characters for which it does not pan out so well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> right. But it's kind of like, well, those diminished, you know, painful, bad things, right? Uh, they're okay, because what they flower into over here is so good. You can embrace it. Um, whereas, if you look at uh, the term good and evil, I think from a realist perspective, good has a very specific meaning, good and evil. Um, the presumption is uh, that what a thing is, right, it's formal cause, uh, to use, er go back to Aristotle, right? Aristotle talks about four different types of causes, formal cause, what a thing is, material cause of what it's made, right? Um, Efficient cause, how it comes about or into existence, and for final cause, a uh, wire for what in it, it exists. And you know, the easiest things are things like ears. Um, you know, a properly formed ear, formal cause, has as its end to hear, right? A properly formed eye has as its end to see. And this is part of how you can tell that it's moving, you know, you know, moving in the right direction in terms of formal causality, you know, becoming what it's supposed to be. Uh, and and looking at that, that applies even to humans, right? So it's a pretty common thing, you know, um, when you're labeled a philosopher, you know, you go to a party, what do you do? Oh, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> What's the meaning of life? And, uh, <laughs> and everybody laughs. But why is that not a worthwhile question? Is there a better question? <laughs> than yeah, that? yeah. Uh, uh, why is that a joke? It's, it shouldn't be a joke. And one of the big questions that, you know, the, the philosophers are really answering, I think this is one of the things that's often missed, not by philosophers themselves who study ancient philosophy, but one thing people don't realize about the philosophers. The philosophers were not just like um, sitting there contemplating weird questions for no reason. They wanted to know, how do I live? And the only way to answer, how do I live, is to answer questions like, where do we come from? What are we? Why are we here? What am I, right? And, you know, if what am I, does that tell me why I am and for what purpose I am? And so, in other words, like, everything was ultimately practical. These seemingly impractical questions had practical ends in terms of what it means to live a good life. Uh, and and this is, you know, and so... so Anyway, uh, w w the way that plan pans out in terms of talking about good and evil for an individual is to say that there's a presumption in the realist that you actually do have proper ends for which you exist and, you know, and live. Um, and your choices can either move you toward that or away from it. That's what is sort of weird about humans. I don't know how often people actually reflect on how strange it is that we have the ability to, you know, rationally, intellectually assess things and then make decisions about whether we want them or not, right? Presumably bees don't sit there and go, what am I? I'm a bee. <laughs> For what end does a bee exist? Do I want to conform to that end or not? Right? It just does, right? Like it just does what it is, right? Um, whereas humans have this extremely bizarre capacity to reflect on the proper end of a thing identify the course of action that would bring it toward that proper end and then choose whether it wants to do that or not. That's so weird. There's nothing else in the cosmos that does that. That's absolutely bizarre. Um, and yet this is exactly why the philosophers think philosophy is so important because at the end of the day, how you define good or evil has to do with identifying what the thing is, what end it exists for which it exists, and then moving toward that accordingly. And they thought that was just as true for me as a human 
as a whole as it is for an eye or for a nose or for an ear, right? The difference is those being involuntary organisms and sort of considered in themselves just develop into that, right? And then start doing what they do. Um, and so uh, the point of all of that is to say that uh, for the Eastern fathers, the way they flesh this out, which as I said, this will be the perspective from which I'm always dealing with these questions, um, is, is that the big problem with something like life itself is that there are multiple characters who never achieve their proper end. Right. Uh, so the problem with this sort of way of talking about good and talking about all these different converging things that somehow result in this flowering of good, really what you're saying is you see a pleasant, pleasing circumstance for a certain group of people. But from the Eastern fathers, what they would see as the real problem is that may be fine. Um, we could first would have to assess whether just because it's pleasant and you know flourishing and fits the sort of life you might like, whether that in fact means it's good. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of lifestyles or life situations we might want that might not actually be for our good. Uh, but the other problem is you look back and there's very clearly uh, characters who, of course, if we stop the narrative at death, which is a big part of the question, let's presume their narrative ends with their death. Good, just because the nuns don't know what happens at death, most of them admit that's the one thing they really don't have a stance on. Um, well, the problem is that character clearly did not, that individual never reached their final end. So the good was never realized for them. Um, they were divergent from the good of whatever a human's supposed to be. Um, and, uh, and then they died divergent from that proper end. Now, of course, the sleight of hand here is that I haven't defined what the proper end of humanity is, right? Uh, but I think it's pretty obvious that nearly losing your mind and being ultimately, you know, wildly depressed and not wanting to live is probably not the end for which humanity exists. <laughs> so, so let's say we're going to leave this big question of what is the end for which humanity exists over here, just like unanswered for a moment. But we could probably get a pretty quick tip to the hat from everybody to say it's probably not that, right? Like we shouldn't strive to be wildly depressed and not want to live. Okay. Okay. So in that case, I can think of at least one character in that film that does not achieve their proper end. And so at the end of the day, when you start to talk about this, the big problem is that, uh, is that you have this, this good over here that we're talking about this, that this all flowers into does not address the fact that this individual never achieved the good. Now, I, I, I do think, of course, the critique that opens up here is that people can say, well, that's too individualistic, right? You're thinking in too individualistic terms and you have to think in more cosmic or global or whatever terms, right? About humanity and the planet and the cosmos. I would say the Eastern Fathers have that concept too, right? They, they have very much a concept of redemption and salvation and proper end for the entire cosmos. Their view of the Christian religion and of salvation and the, you know, all of this does culminate in something that's not primarily just for man, and then you blow up the cosmos, right? It really does include the salvation of the entire cosmos, you know, plants, animals, all this sort of stuff. Right. Um, and that's a complicated topic that we could talk about, but at least just, just recognizing that they have that, but they don't think that ever justifies the sort of sacrifice of individuals, right? You know, the cosmos is composed of individuals. And so um, it's not just uh, sort of saying, well, we'll sacrifice a bunch of individuals who never confirm form to the good, as long as we get this one like sort of outcome up here. Right. That would be, um, that would be Thanos in the Marvel Cinematic Universe to snap yeah. his fingers and, oh, we've got two, we've got, who, who, who did this guy's math? We're going to kill half the pandas because we've got, <laughs> 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 Sorry, he is my favorite character. I think he's wildly wrong, but I appreciate his rationalism. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you're right. It is, it is this Thanos logic, right, that says, look, at the end of the day, 
um, we're just going to have to kill off a bunch of people, you know, but at least the future generations that survive it will be grateful. And I'm the only one who's willing to do what needs to be done here. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> Clearly, he went to war with everyone because he's the only one willing, uh, I guess him and his henchmen, you know, maybe. <laughs> anyway, you're right. Well, I, I, I very much, I very much appreciate you laying that out because, you know, part of what's happening Part of what's happening, I mean, some of what I've stumbled into is a, a renaissance, if you will. Oh, let me back this up. I have so many thoughts that just came in. It, part, so you're, you're a movie maker, and it's, it's interesting because when you think about a movie like Life Itself, which is a, which is a beautiful film, just as, just as you said, movie watching always has implicit within it I'm sure movie makers have worked on this. The the subject we watch the movie and we mm -hmm. watch the movie through the camera, and mm -hmm. that that obviously guides not only some, you know the perspective that we have of the events within the movie, but also the evaluations. And so, mm -hmm. just like you said, this um, this one person who. In, in, in almost anyone's estimation, did not achieve her end. Mm -hmm. um, her sacrifice achieves a, a particular end. And also with most American films, the, the value system reflects, well, what is of the highest value? Right. Well, you know, romance, romance is of the highest value. Right, uh, right. Two soulmates can find each other and, you know, we'll cut the film mm -hmm. and imagine they live happily ever after. I mean, absolutely. The, the movie, the movie <laughs> creates a world, much of which we may or may not be conscious of mm -hmm. and are not necessarily invited to evaluate. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what has happened in our culture, part of the reason why people might joke, Oh, you're a philosopher. What's the meaning of life is that we're, we're too busy watching movie after movie um, as John Verveke would say, following, I think it's Frank, for bullshitting ourselves with mm -hmm. all of this stimulation and entertainment so mm -hmm. as to not pause and say, maybe there is a, an end for which mm -hmm. I was created. Mm -hmm. what, what might the decisions of my, what, how might my daily decisions um, pursue such mm -hmm. an end? What right. kinds of disciplines might I need in life? And, and then in that process, actually beginning to construct a life that has meaning and mm -hmm. purpose and ends. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, here's where I'd say like, there's three sort of components um, to this that again, hope offer some, these aren't, obviously we'd be here for a very long time if I fleshed out a full, like here's, Eastern patristic worldview and all of this stuff. But I, I think there's three things that are somewhat informative that, that are at least initial seeds of, of a different perspective on this than what you might get from say life itself. Um, and uh, you know, one of those is the, how critical realism actually is to the answering of those questions. So um, it's presumed that it's recognized that for example, uh, your eye right? Your eye is composed. It's not a simple, right? There, there's this talk of God being simple and then creatures are not simple. And that probably sounds weird. And people are like, what does that mean? And basically all it means is something that's complex is composed of multiple parts, right? Um, or more importantly, a complex nature is composed of multiple sub -natures. So your eye, we can talk uh, truthfully about the nature of an eye, that holds to, that that is a real thing, right? Eyes. That's an eye. That's an eye. That's that's a real thing. That's a real nature. But it's a complex nature in the sense that it holds together within it a series of sub natures. So your eyes have you know retina, which is one type of you know uh, one type of of thing sub nature. You've got uh, you know veins. You've got you know animal cells in there, right? You've got all these sorts of things uh, that are also themselves sort of natures unto themselves and that are shared, right, with other types of things. Animal cells are not unique just to your eye, right? We can find them throughout your entire body. Um, so it's not unique to an eye. Uh, so it's a complex nature because it is something that holds together a series of sub lower natures. And, and 
And incidentally, one of the reasons that people like Basil of Caesarea uh, presume that there's a sort of ontological depth to their reality is that they recognize that it's not, it, they don't know how far that reality goes down. And that's why they presume there's a wall in terms of our epistemology. How much do we really know about what a thing is? Because they recognize we know certain basic things about what it is, but that keeps on, they presume that just keeps on going down and there's a depth of ontology would be one way of putting it uh, to what things are. But what they did recognize is that when you identify, the, when you ask the question, what is the final end or Call it final cause, the telos, right? The, the, the end for which a thing exists, like an eye. One of the key questions is what sets it apart as unique, right? So when Aristotle would define things, his process for providing a definition was that you identified its genus uh, and then you identified specific difference. And by genus, we don't, it's genus and species, I've been using these terms, but in philosophy and Aristotelian logic, that's, that's just sort of large group, small group. It's not, you know, uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species sort of stuff uh, that's used in science that's totally different sort of cataloging system. So for Aristotle, right, you would say the reason he identifies man as a rational animal is because he says animal is the genus, right? That's the largest, that's the larger group, not the largest. Uh, largest might be, you know, being, right, or creature, right, or something like that. Uh, but its large group is animal, that's the genus. And then its specific difference, what sets it apart from the others is that it's rational. Now, of course, Eastern fathers like Basil would say, there's far more to the definition of man. That's a nice starting point to differentiate it, uh, but there's a whole bunch more to what makes human a human. But the reason Aristotle is concerned with genus and specific difference is because specific difference tells you the proper end of the thing. Hmm. Because animal cells in your eye are shared with a whole bunch of other things. So the animal cells don't really tell you much about what its proper end is. But once you get to the capacity to see, now you've reached something that sets it apart from an ear or from a nose or some other organ in your body. Um, and this, of course, becomes the foundation of uh, natural law ethics, right? Because you're getting into these issues of saying, uh, what is the proper use of a thing? And, and the good of the thing is tied with its you know, nature and its proper use. Anyway, this is, this is one of, I, I, but I think that's a critical concept, putting aside whether you would buy wholesale everything that's in natural law ethics, I think the insight of natural law ethics is critical. Um, and, and here I should do a little aside. Natural law ethics sometimes is treated like it's consequentialism. Like don't have sex kids because you get STDs. Like that is not natural law ethics at all, actually. Um, <laughs> natural law ethics have to do with things like don't scrape your eyeballs, kids, because that'll hinder their ability to see. Uh, that would be <laughs> natural law ethics. Or even interesting things like don't eat that weird um, food that has been engineered in such a way that it has no caloric impact because essentially what you're doing is you're trying to harness the pleasure of eating, which is a byproduct, while undercutting nutrition, right. which is the primary end for which you have a digestive system. Uh, so anyway, it gets more into things like that. Right. That's natural law ethics. Uh, it's much more philosophically astute than just consequentialism, which is sort of a John Locke nominalist uh, form of, of uh, natural law ethics, uh, which isn't really natural law. It's consequentialism. Um, but anyway, so I think one of the things, one of the components in there is that the realism, which I mentioned as I think is critical to the entire worldview of the Eastern Christian writers, and, and which I think is just a critical distinction in general in a lot of the, the conversations going on, is also critical to how you begin to address these questions of what is the end for which, you know, I exist. Uh, it's, and that's why Aristotle was so concerned with specific difference, because he concludes reason being primary has to have something to do with the fact that we're humans. Um, our proper end, because that's what sets humans apart from other things. And that's why Aristotle would probably be inclined to say sex is probably much less important because there's lots of animals that have sex. Now, of course, the character is say, therefore, sex has no part in human existence. And that's not, again, it's not natural law ethics, right? Um, nor is it realist ethics. It's just saying that whatever the hierarchy of goods and however we begin to work that out, that question, 
needs to recognize the primacy of reason as the unique feature of humanity, primacy of reason, free choice, those sorts of abstract thinking, those sorts of things. So I think that's one component um, that is, is helpful and begins to push against the sort of utilitarian, just whatever life circumstances, you know, happiest. Yeah, they fall in love, right? Um, and they have kids and that's great, right? And we're all pleased with it now and we can go home. Uh, and and I, 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 think, I think a realist pursu- pursuit of the question of the good, right? And the good specifically for human beings, but also for the cosmos. Uh, has to be realist in orientation. I think it offers a much more substantive assessment of those things. I think the other thing is, that's critical is the question of where you cut off the narrative. And this is why I think the death problem is a real big problem. Uh, the fact that Before certain the characters in there die without ever achieving happiness is a big, big problem, right? And I would say that one of the things that I find fascinating about the Eastern Fathers is that their narrative of the the pursuit or God's pursuit of the good, right? Like, so let's, let's take this as, you know, the life itself versus, you know, the Eastern patristic God. Um, The life, it's life itself ends up, it stops pursuing the narrative. It stops pursuing the good of an individual the second they die, right? Like it's over. And now we continue on with the continuing living things, right? Whereas in Eastern patristic thought, the pursuit of the individual is good never stops, right? It is an in perpetuity pursuit. Um, and you could see this in a couple of interesting, I think counterintuitive, or I shouldn't say counterintuitive, um, things that would be alien to Western uh, sort of Christian narratives, many Western Christian traditions. Um, one of the things that's, uh, I, I, I'll give two examples here. The one example of this is um, is uh, when Maximus the Confessor, uh, uh, one of the Eastern Church Fathers, he um, he talks about uh, Christ's descent into Hades, right? So uh, this is uh, in Second Peter, where it talks about uh, Peter's letter, where he talks about Christ um, preaching to those who rebelled in the time of Noah, and in the early church, this was understood as Christ dies, right, gives up his soul, and his soul goes where? Well, to the realm of the dead. It, I mean, Hades, right, and Hades just meant the realm of the dead. So he went wherever dead people go, right? Should be relatively uncontroversial. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, he died, he goes, it's almost ta- tautological, right? You can't, uh, he went wherever dead people go. And so, um, and part of that is uh, Holy Saturday is the celebration of this this narrative of Christ going into Hades and preaching to all the other dead and declaring um, who he is and the gospel of Christianity uh, and all of this sort of stuff. Um, anyway, Peter, this is how Peter was understood when it talks about this in, in Second Peter, right? That he preached to those who uh, had rebelled in the time of Noah, that those people are long dead, and he goes and he preaches to them. And they're sort of a snapshot of all the people who have died before that and are in Hades and then rebelled and all that. But one of the things that's interesting in Maximus's treatment of this is he points out the the one of the passages, uh, I think it's like Second Peter 4, 6 or something like that. Uh, he talks about, Peter also talks about, they were judged in the flesh, uh, according to men, in order that they may live in spirit, according to God, or something like that. It's uh, some sort of formulation like that. And the way Maximus interprets that is he says, unlike sort of the, let's say, the average um, sort of evangelical presumption that you had all these really bad people who were doing really bad things in the time of Noah, God drown them because they're really bad, and now they're in hell, right? Like, and that's and they'll be punished forever for all the things they did. Uh, Maximus interprets this as they were already punished for being horrible people. How they were drowned? That's not good enough for you. <laughs> <laughs> like, people get upset about waterboarding. How about just full load drowning? Like, it, that's, <laughs> um, and so, and but. The, but this is where the idea of the unmaking of humanity is a critical step in the redemption of man in Eastern patristic thought. Mm-hmm. So the presumption is that man has in some way been corrupted. This is, uh, you know, there, there's something that's gone awry in our nature. 
Um, it's not the original sin doctrine of Augustine, but it's still something that's corrupt that makes us basically inclined to do things we uh, shouldn't do, right? And that manifests in all sorts of different ways. Some people are sexual perverts. That's how it manifests. Some people are, you know, um, hot-headed and inclined toward anger. That's how it, and some people are inclined toward gluttony. All of these are just distortions of our nature where we have impulses or passions that incline us in directions we shouldn't be inclined. And we tend to submit to those. Uh, and, and, and the presumption is that a big part of remaking us, right, this, the hope of the resurrection from the dead, uh, is that you first have to unmake us and undo that corruption. Um, and so the death of the body is the sending back to the body to its basic elements in order to unmake it, right? Uh, and the only thing that's left is the one thing that's not soluble with the soul. Now, of course, the soul needs to be converted. It needs to be turned back to God. It needs to be corrected and, and uh, part ways with uh, its various, the corruptions that it's been accustomed to and that it's desired and that it's committed to and recognize the true good, which is God and order things accordingly. Um, otherwise, you're just going to remake it and it's going to be corrupted all over again. Um, now, the reason that's important is because they presume part of the thing that Maximus talks about here is that basically the people who were in rebellion were unmade, right? Lewis talks, C.S. Lewis talks about this in his space trilogy when one of the uh, angels are talking to the, uh, the uh, scientists who are corrupt and evil, right, who have landed on their planet, and one of the angels says, well, if you were my man, I would unmake you <laughs> in order to remake you, right? And that's what he says, right? He says something along those lines. Uh, and Lewis being very influenced by the Eastern Fathers is attuned to these sorts of nuances in their thinking. Anyway, what's fascinating is that how Maximus interprets the they were judged in the flesh as men or that they may live according to God is the idea that they converted, that they were unmade in their rebellion and could no longer act on any of their corruption or passions or any of these things like this. And they sat in darkness until the Son of God uh, appeared to them and preached to them, and they now had the ability to repent and be redeemed so that in the resurrection they could actually be remade um, as they were created to be. And I think one of the reasons that's a fascinating nuance is because if you think, for example, of like Moses and Pharaoh, right? Moses is this warning about destruction and being hard hearted toward God and all this sort of stuff. But for them, uh, the death of Pharaoh may well be the only way to actually fix someone like Pharaoh, because it may be that the only way someone like Pharaoh, who believes himself to be a god, uh, can ever uh, find his his pro it can truly be broken such that he recognizes he is no god at all, uh, would be for him to be unmade and be completely unable to act on any of his uh, desires, wants, passions, any of those sorts of things. So that's one element to it, where I think one of the things that's fascinating is how the Eastern Fathers interpret all of these Old Testament passages and things like that about wrath, is they see, the, they see a, a redemptive intent, similar to life itself in the sense that it's always driving toward the good, but the difference is it's driving toward the good, meaning of that individual, every individual, every creature becoming what it's supposed to be, relentlessly, even if it means like in the case of Pharaoh or in the case of those who drowned in rebellion in the time of, of, of uh, Noah, that, that unmaking the creature is, you know, an inevitability in terms of the only, you know, way forward in terms of redeeming them. So that's one component where I think it's fascinating that the extending of the narrative out, of their story out, is, is critical to how they see meaning in those things. Um, and I think the other thing is, uh, in terms of another example of this, is one of the things you begin to see in their understanding of um, eschatology and future judgment, heaven, hell, those sorts of things. For the Eastern Fathers, very much, they tend to see heaven and hell not so much as places, locations. They see them as states or conditions of the soul, right? So um, Chrysostom, for example, says uh, he has no need of a place called heaven when he can become heaven, right? This is where they see the critical statement of Christ being um, the kingdom of God is within you, right? They see this, this as that's where paradise is. Uh, Chris is them again in his homily on the, I think it's called the cross in the graveyard, something like that. He's talking about the thief on the cross who Christ says, today you'll be with me in paradise. But then Chrysostom says, but 
he's re- when he's resurrected, he says he he hasn't ascended to see his father, right? Wherever that is. Uh, he's, uh, he says, so where has he been? He's been in the realm of the dead. So how was he in paradise? And Christensen's answer is he was with Christ. And, you know, wherever Christ is, is paradise. And this is why uh, being even in Hades with uh, the Son of God is paradise, right? Uh, this sorts of thing. And similarly, in terms of hell, then you have the inverse, right? Where you take a, you take a creature uh, that is miserable, uh, you know, you see this, I, I always found this fascinating. I don't know if you remember the A&E show intervention, right? Yeah. But you have, yeah. you have these yeah. addicts, right? Yeah. And they'd be, they'd be interviewing them before the intervention. They'd say, oh, I'm miserable. I'd be better off dead, you know, all this sort of stuff. And then people would intervene. They'd say, how dare you? And, <laughs> <laughs> and that was always the weird thing. And then they'd also think about, like, I'm not sure I want to be clean, which was also very bizarre, right? Because you're like, you were just saying you're miserable. You'd be better off dead and so on. But I'm so attached to this. I don't know if I want life without it, which is a weird thing. Um, and basically, the, the, their whole point is if you take someone like that who is in a living hell, stick them in a city with streets of gold, they're still in hell, right? Like, it doesn't matter where they are. And similarly, you know, with saints, you take them and you put them out in the desert and the desert becomes paradise for them because it doesn't matter where they are. Uh, the where, the location is a matter of indifference. Um, so one of the reasons I think that's important is because even in the Eastern Church, you see uh, differences amongst many of the Eastern Fathers on the question of whether or not eventually all will be redeemed, right? This universal salvation thing, which um, was sort of a big controversy. Um, and uh, it's a big controversy in the East, um, partially because it's one of those things that's, well, I'll take the risk of saying it's never really fully settled in the Eastern Church, right? It's oftentimes thought of as um, condemned and over and settled because of the condemnation of the originists uh, at Constantinople II. Um, but uh, anyway, there's 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 reason to think uh, that uh, that is not a full blown condemnation of universal salvation in all its forms, uh, originistic apocatastasis. Uh, its view it was basically Hindu, right? The souls transcend matter and disappear back into God, right? It was a very specific form of universal salvation that uh, was considered problematic and Justinian. Uh, submitted anathemas for consideration before the council, one of which actually um, condemned universal salvation in all its forms, and the council's actual anathemas did not adopt that anathema in its form, which some have taken, people like Callistus Ware, have taken to indicate um, that this is because the council did not see all forms of universal salvation as problematic. Hence, you have people like St. Gregory of Nyssa, who is a canonized saint, but it believes in universal salvation, right? That sort of thing. Uh, anyway, this is one of those things where universal salvation gets into this weird gray area where it seems to be, it's not dogma. It's most certainly not dogma in the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's um, a minority position for sure, right, in the Eastern Orthodox Church. But it seems to be an open question in the Eastern Orthodox Church. They don't know, right? And um, even when you look at, like, the ransacking of Hades, the Eastern Fathers on that, right, Christ preaching to those in Hades, you have some who seem to talk as if uh, Christ, you know, liberated the dead, and for that reason, nobody's left, right? And all, you know, were ultimately redeemed. Some seem to think that, nope, anybody who, who was down there and rebelled wanted to, wanted to rebel, and they continued to rebel, even though the only person keeping them there was them, right? And then some seem to hold the middle ground where it's like, well, anybody who wanted out could get out, right, uh, at that point. And, and there's sort of this gradation. Anyway, it's not really a subtle question. But one of the things that's fascinating about it is if you put aside the people who are sympathetic toward universal salvation, and you just look at the Eastern patristic writers who, are, who definitively think universal salvation is false, right? One of the things that you find is, you find that, first of all, they think um, anybody who is uh, damned, right, in the state of damnation, uh, in that state of misery, is damned by choice, right? This is the hell is locked from the inside sort of doctrine. So someone like Chrysostom, who is clearly opposed to universal salvation, in his treatment of the unpartable sin passage, 
uh, in the New Testament where Christ talks about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is this unpardonable sin. Chrysostom points out that Christ never says that it is per se unpardonable, meaning of such a kind that it could not in principle be pardoned. Uh, Christ says it won't be pardoned, and Chrysostom's interpretation of this is that it is in principle pardonable. There's nothing about it that's worse than any of these other sins that are pardoned. It's just that those who commit it, you know, which is basically the sin is identifying the good as in some way demonic or evil, um, which is what, you know, the Pharisees were doing in those passages, um, has in some ways willfully, you know, rejected the good and can't see it anymore and don't want it anymore. And that's, and, and there's no way to turn back to God when that's the condition you're in. Uh, because God is the good. And so Chrysostom's conclusion, even though he opposes universal salvation, pretty clearly thinks hell is locked from the inside, right? Those people are in a damnable state because they can no longer see the good and they perpetually reject it. Uh, And this is one of the reasons why one of the things that comes out in certain fathers, is sort of subtle, but you start to look at enough passages in the Eastern Christian writers, is that they seem to think what is the case is that all are raised, uh, you know, God gives himself to all, the veil of the divine glory is sort of lifted and Christ shines into the world, but um, it is the subjective condition of the individual that determines their experience of it. For those who are in a condition who love God, right, it's, it's, it's pleasant and it's desirable, and for those who do not, it's unpleasant, right? And so the idea being that there is a sort of subjective uh, experience that's different uh, not an objective condition that's that's different. All have been redeemed, right? Christ has redeemed all and raised all and all this sort of stuff, but it's the condition of the individual that determines whether that's desirable or undesirable. Now, the reason I think that's, that's interesting um, is because when you begin to look at this question of redemption and the pursuit of individuals, really what you begin to see when you bring those two things together is even for the folks who well, even for the folks who uh, reject universal salvation, hell, right, the eternity of hell, is really an equilibrium between God's refusal to abandon a creature to its own devices. It continues to uphold its existence, continues to beckon it to the good, continues to give himself to it and call it back to the good, refuses to destroy it because that would be to abandon and hope of it ever attaining its proper end and the creature refusing to ever uh, embrace its good. And so even in the reality of hell, you have with certain of these fathers that they see a redemptive intent there, right? Mm-hmm. The reality of hell is this equilibrium emerging out of uh, the perpetual pursuit of the creature and the creature's perpetual retreat. So what I find fascinating there, uh, taking these two examples together, is what you begin to find when you look at these Eastern fathers is you see they extend the narrative not only beyond death, right? They, they, they see it extended out in perpetuity uh, because ultimately they see the characters, each individual's, your story, my story, not just being about this life, but even death itself can be part of the redemptive story of the creature. Right. And then even in the eschaton, for those who still, uh, under the presumption, you either have people who think ultimately this has to pan out where all do achieve their good, right? And you have universal salvation folks like Gregory Nyssa, or you have people who don't think it pans out that way, but they still believe as part of the picture of the eschaton is this perpetual pursuit of the creature. And it's only because of the creature's refusal to embrace its redemption that, you know, hell becomes a reality. So I, I would say, I know that's a very long and complex sort of picture, <laughs> but I, I think it's an important difference between the life itself picture, which has a very thin, this worldly, finite, temporary picture of happiness, right? People get married. Like what happens to that couple? Okay, so they they got married, they're uh, happy, they have kids, they're thrilled. Yeah. And then what? You know, it's, they don't grow old. They don't grow <laughs> old. Kids One of them doesn't get Alzheimer's, right? Like they don't, you know, cancer doesn't set it at any point. Some like, of that mental illness and mom didn't get into the daughter. <laughs> right. Like it's a, you look at that and you go, okay, so you basically what you have is you sliver of goodness for a certain snapshot. Right. And your hope is that that sliver, that snapshot is enough to uh, make up for all of this other craziness that we've just seen down here right. that was required in order to get us there. Um, 
but there is no sort of lasting the good. Whereas uh, the contrast, of course, of our simplified is the Eastern patristic view is that the good of each individual and of every component of the cosmos is, is critical to the narrative. But the difference is that though the achievement of that good is not limited to this world, nor does death even mark the end of the narrative for the individual. Um, the, the true narrative extends really, really far down the road. Um, and I think this is probably clearest as just I'll in this long monologue I've been doing with this, <laughs> this um, is that there's this doctrine uh, called, you know, the eighth day doctrine that you see in a lot of the Eastern fathers. And it's because one of the things they recognize that is that in the Genesis narrative, um, there's the setting out to make man. And unlike a lot of the other components of the narrative, it doesn't seem that the making man is ever completed. Uh, and this comes through in things like God saying, let us make man in our own image and according to our likeness, and then he makes man in his own image and the likeness is not repeated. And it's presumed the likeness is something more, something that has to be actively entered into, right? This is the good, right? So the image provides the grounding ontology, what we are that allows us to move toward our good, but the likeness is the actual active entrance into it. And because man is never fully made there, and one of the things also in the narrative is the seventh day isn't closed, right? So in all the narrative, you have this beginning and end all these days, and then the seventh day never closes. It comes out that they think we're in the seventh day. Right. So in other words, Genesis sets up um, this narrative that what we are still in is the making of man, which also in their theology is critical to the making of the rest of the cosmos too which that's the part I forewent because it's more complicated and, you know, probably would be a totally different conversation sometime. But uh, what, what that then allows you to see is to look at the whole of our own stories and the cosmic story and history as part of one long creation narrative that is still in process and still has not culminated. Um, and that's where, uh, that's, that's, I think, sort of the, the thing that really begins to capture the Eastern patristic worldview is that we are all part of this making of man that takes place. The incarnation is part of the making of man. Resurrection is part of the making of man. Our own individual stories are part of the making of man. Our death and our unmaking is part of the making of man. And none of it culminates until we really get to um, the resurrection from the dead and the redemption of not just all right. of humanity, but also of the cosmos, right? Uh, and all of that. So anyway, um, it's a much it's a much more robust narrative than yeah. these people got together and were happy for this sliver in time, and so all of this other horrific stuff is is okay. <laughs> and unfortunately, the um, it. Boy, there's you. We're running up into a time deadline that I didn't think we'd even get close to. <laughs> I'm, I'm very enough. happy about that. I'll say. Oh, that. Okay, good, good. And because this has been very helpful for me, there's so much more I'd love to. Because I mean, the whole. I mean, I because you've given me a really nice introduction into, and I'm sure it's just a sliver into the Eastern patristics. And this has been yeah. very helpful for me. And I think a lot of people will find it very interesting. Um, but there are many, you know, when it comes to, so, so I am not, I, I try to keep reminding people, I am not a philosopher. I am not a theologian. I'm a pastor. And what that means is I live in this intersection between all these folks going to life itself and saying, I just found myself in that film. <laughs> That's right. And me saying, how much of you is there really? Uh, <laughs> don't you want more for yourself? Uh -huh. um, can't, you, can't you just with just a little bit of, I mean, even the deconstruction that's being offered to you by almost everybody on a street corner today, deconstruct a little bit of this vision that was presented to you and suggest perhaps there is something more to you and you should want more than, than, than just this. Um, mm -hmm. but there are, you know, and, and I think in some ways the, the, you know, the, this moment right now with respect to the nuns, mm -hmm. uh, N-O-N-E-S, mm -hmm. you haven't been clear on that. Yeah. Somebody's going to leave thinking about those right. women and habits. Someone's they don't believe in God? <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten that one numerous times, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's so much here to dig through and I know you have a time commitment. So. Mm -hmm. Um, 
yeah, I, I, I wouldn't imagine we'd go for almost, almost uh, two and a half hours and th- <laughs> left things unsaid. But yeah. I, I feel that way because this, this question about the nuns is very much in, in even the, the question about persons, be, because this question, this, this representation they have in their mind about what Christianity asserts the God mm-hmm. is. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, uh, maybe we'll have to have a second conversation. Yeah, or a third, I guess. Technically, this this would be our second conversation. Well, and part of the reason I wanted to have that first conversation was, I want at least for those who are willing to sit through hours of video, which people on my channel clearly are, <laughs> um, I wanted them to know that for you, this you're not just some egghead that is nerdy about books, but mm-hmm. what brought you here to read Basil and Chrysostom and all of these Eastern patristics mm-hmm. is in fact the question at a party that says, so what's the meaning of life? How right. should I live my life? Right. Yeah. And, and you're right. That is, that is the case. Right. And anybody who listens to the other podcasts or watched coming truly human will know that for me, this was not, um, this was not an academic exercise in order to ask these questions and, and read all this. In fact, um, it's one of the reasons why, if you look at my academic career, my publishing record, my degrees, all that sort of stuff, it's a very, it's a very poor cobbled together way of building a career. If you want to build a career, right? Like it's very clear, like you, you kill it on the, you know, the ACTs and you go off to Harvard and, you know, you get the right degrees and then you pick a very narrow focus that nobody cares about. And you write about that very narrow thing for the rest of your life and slowly climb your way up the tenure track. And so, and one of the reasons my, um, resume and academic career looks so mishmashy is because it really wasn't driven by building a career. It was built, it was driven entirely by um, the questions, right? The questions of, you know, does God exist? Do we have free will? Why are we here? How ought I to live? All those sorts of questions. And, um, and the roads I wandered through, you know, as we talked about, were not, um, were not very conventional, right? And they were driven by this is where I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the questions uh, that you find with the nuns because I was a nun, not the kind with a habit, uh, <laughs> but I was one of those nuns. And um, my hangups on the problem of evil, divine hiddenness, right? Can you trust God? Is God capricious? All those sorts of things. Those sorts of issues I, I recognized as, as pivotal issues. And um, I never went to the full blown, you know, karma fate impersonal God, but I certainly went toward uh, a form of pantheism and, you know, process philosophy uh, is a form of pantheism, panentheism, you know, so yeah, so you're right. For me, this was not, um, it's not like I just went to college and I took a class and we read some Eastern church fathers and I thought, hmm, I want to be a classicist when I grow up and (laughs) just started reading certain guys in Greek. It was a, it was a much more existential uh, journey for me um, that was very twisty and turning until um, it actually settled, right? It settled in Eastern Orthodoxy. And, um, and that's one of the reasons I always speak from that perspective because it's, where I landed and what I found to be most um, satisfying in terms of the various, uh, I use data points when we talked, right? This idea that what science does is it takes a series of data points and then the hypothesis is the way of uh, coming up with a coherent way of dealing with those. You know, in many ways, that was the sort of methodology I was doing with worldview issues. Um, And eventually that led me down the road um, to, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. So yeah, it's definitely not an academic exercise. You're correct. I'm not an egghead with a love of books. <laughs> <laughs> Do that. You have a love of books, clearly, and but it's it's also it's wedded to your life, right? And, and the questions have been driving you. And I'm I'm blessed that you've been driven this way, even if it's kind of a messy way to make a career. And I hope that, <laughs> but I hope that you can take this stuff because. I mean, part of my point here is that life itself is life itself is what people, the movie life itself is what people are imbibing and that is forming and shaping. And that, that has implications, ramifications and consequences Mm 
mm-hmm. all around us. Yeah. And, and it's helpful to have, I think, a better informed, um, a, a better informed, better informed people also shaping film. I mean, of course, this is, I graduate of Calvin College. This is what Calvin College is supposed to be about. So, right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. You have well, to go. I do have to go. You're right. You're right, Paul. But, um, but I am, I'm happy to continue this conversation again sometime should you want to uh, pick up and, and, and see what loose ends we can tie up. <laughs> oh, 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 there's, there's people. Well, how will you spend eternity? Well, I, I don't know what eternity feels like, but I see a lot of good things to do. So. <laughs> Great. But thank you for your time. My, my pleasure, Paul. And we'll swap emails and figure something out. Sounds good. All okay. right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.